can you speak to, because you already spoke to the saturated fat, this HDL, LDL, you, you had just recently posted Dr. Fung's study looking at non-HDL cholesterol. Maybe you could speak to that. But like, this is something people ask me about all the time. And it's so critical. They understand that this LDL, total mm -hmm. cholesterol stuff is, in my eyes, nonsense. Unless you're terribly ill, you've had lots of disease, you're terribly sick, you're not interested in making lifestyle changes, you're not interested in doing those things. Okay, take 20 drugs, let them do what they have to do to d decrease your risk. I don't practice that way. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say? Like, how do you present that to, to people to ask you? Right, right. It's, this is a, a timely question. My class, my primary undergraduate uh, teaching assignment is a class called pathophysiology. So some people listening might have taken this. You know, the physician will take pathology, um, but the version I teach is pathophysiology. So rather than how the tissue looks when it's not working well, we study more about how it's working when it's not working well. And we're just about to get to the blood vessel disorders lecture. And, and at that point in the lecture or in the semester, I, um, I, I ask the students to just humor me. And I say, what I'm about to teach you for the next 30 minutes isn't on the test, but it's, it's basically a dismantling of the lipid um, heart hypothesis which is to what you alluded to that eating saturated fat will increase cholesterol which will increase atherosclerotic plaque formation which will increase my uh, heart attack risk that really is the that is the theory uh, or the, the hypothesis and unfortunately what has happened uh, not only unique to the lipid heart hypothesis but in many other areas of medicine and science the hypothesis has become embraced as fact um, without ever undergoing the rigor of scientific inquiry and intervention that you would need in order to establish it as close to fact. The scientific method is this ongoing process of continually attempting to prove yourself wrong. This has never been more obviously not the case um, with the explosion of COVID and this explosion of um, an obsession with science, more as a religious creed than it is a pursuit of truth, and through through a skeptical process, constantly questioning yourself, um, it, it really has become a declaration of faith now to just proudly proclaim that you believe in science. And the irony is that's a very unscientific way to uh, to to speak. Now, nevertheless, with lipid and cholesterol, I we just have to make sure that the audience is aware that. Every single conclusion on this topic is based on correlational interventions, or, or, or rather there's some aspect of correlational conclusion where you have to just make some assumptions. Um, the, the, some of the most compelling data comes from some very large um, institutional studies done decades ago in the 50s or so which had people eat diets of high that were, these were people who were in fact institutionalized. So they had total control over their diet, a study that you could not get approval to do today. And they followed them for years. They had one group eating in, in a cafeteria that had high saturated fat, the other group eating in a cafeteria that had high polyunsaturated fat, you know, like the fat from soybean oil, et cetera. That group, the high soybean oil consuming or seed oil consuming group, they had lower cholesterol levels, which often will happen if you eat these polyunsaturated fatty acids from these seed oils that are high in phytosterols. It will tend to reduce normal cholesterol, the, the human sterol rather than the plant sterol formed. It will reduce cholesterol levels. And if that hypothesis was accurate, that more cholesterol caused heart disease, they should have died more. In fact, they did not. The, the group that had the lower cholesterol, and indeed, they even quantified it in one of the studies. It was either the Minnesota Coronary Experiment or the Sydney Diet Heart Study. One of them quantified and found that something like for every 30 millig milligram per deciliter reduction in cholesterol, there was like a 20% increase in overall risk of just dying from mm -hmm. anything. So they were dying more, and across a handful of correlational studies, we see this consistent theme that the lower the cholesterol, the more likely the person is just to die, or they have higher risk of cancer, they have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. This is because we have vilified cholesterol, and yet it is absolutely a molecule of life. 
it is involved in so many fundamental processes, some of which you've already mentioned, including lipid hormone production, all the sex hormones, um, aspects of the mitochondria are based on cholesterol. Vitamin D is based Skin. on cholesterol and everything it does, and more and more. So declaring war on a molecule of life that is so fundamental to life is just foolhardy and silly. Um, so um, what then matters, and you've touched on it, um, we, I published a paper with Paul Mason and David Diamond uh, last year where we found that it, regardless of what someone's LDL levels were, high or low, it didn't really have any impact on their heart disease risk. What did is if they had this this uh, high triglyceride to HDL ratio, basically. Um, it, it, uh, the high triglyceride to HDL ratio is actually a reflection of, not that even that is a direct contributor to plaque formation, but it reflects an overall unhealthy metabolic milieu within the body. If a person has high triglycerides and low HDL, then they very likely have insulin resistance. And that's likely a direct effect of the insulin resistance at the liver who's responsible um, for those um, molecules. It's the liver that's making triglycerides primarily. Of course, there's some coming from the diet. Um, that would be the chylomicron. But if a person's fasted, that is not part of the equation. So the triglycerides are coming from the liver. HDL is coming from the liver. And as the liver becomes insulin resistant and the body becomes hyperinsulinemic, which always comes with insulin resistance, there's no insulin resistance without hyperinsulinemia except starvation, um, true starvation. Mm -hmm. I don't mean fasting. Um, but in that case, then the triglycerides will go up, the HDL will go down, and it's likely the insulin resistance um, that is uh, the primary contributor. And that was the study that you'd mentioned that Jason Fung had shared, and a lot of us were retweeting. This big paper published, I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at the five most relevant risk factors for heart disease, and cholesterol was barely above normal. I mean, right. it was it was it was largely irrelevant. In fact, often not even reaching a point of statistical significance. And yet, type two diabetes was heads and shoulders higher than any other risk factor. And of course, type two diabetes is insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is, I would contend, the main contributor to atherosclerosis or plaque formation. Not to say it's the only one. There would be some other ones, including linoleic acid from seed oils, that are very very likely directly contributing as well. So I don't think it's a single factor here, but regardless, once again, insulin resistance is something that connects um, a, a chronic disease that you wouldn't have imagined that has a metabolic origin. 